Hello everybody and welcome. This is Brian. This is my review of the Nichromat FT2. Uh, first let's go over the uh, basic features of the camera. We've got in fr on the uh, front of the camera right here is the um, aperture indexing coupling pin which mates to the prong on the lens. Uh, this is a pre-AI camera which requires the pre-AI lens mounting procedure. I've done a separate video on that. If you're not familiar please have a look. Uh, we also have the a uh, mirror lock-up lever that is down, push it down the oh, actually, you know what, let's, let's, let's take a look at that, here we go. Mirror lock-up, push it down, mirror goes up, push it up, and mirror goes back down, okay, there we go, mirror lock-up. Um, this is the lens release button, you press that to release the lens because that's what a lens release button does. Um, and we've got the ASA setting gizmo. is really unusual on this camera, or on Nichromats in general. Um, you have to pull out this tab on this lever, which then frees up this... Jeez, oh how to do this. All right, pull out this tab on th this lever here, which frees up this bracket. The bracket moves around and you set the bracket to the correct um, ASA, which is just the old-fashioned uh, designation for ISO, if you didn't know that. Um, and then release the bracket, and this is now released the, the safety catch, and this bracket is now locked in place. Uh, this is an update of the earlier version on the FT, uh, on the FTN rather, uh, which used a similar procedure but without this locking uh, tab here. Uh, and the criticism was uh, that the um, uh, the ASA setting could get knocked out of register accidentally um, because you, it was just held in place by um, it just depend uh, just depended upon how tightly the thing was fit. Um, here's a self timer lever. Um, it does not double as the depth of field preview like on many other cameras. It's just a self timer lever. Uh, let's take a look at the bottom plate. The bottom plate of the FT2. Fairly typical of that era. All you've got is a, a tripod socket. You got the um, button to release the take-up spool for before you rewind your film, and you got the battery door and the battery compartment opens up. It's not a screw thing. It's it's um, uh, it, you, you don't unscrew it. It just takes like a quarter turn. That right there, that zero. Uh, that's an O that stands for open, so you turn it in this direction to open the cover and you just put the coin in, give it a quarter turn, and it pops right open, and that's it. Um, that's, the, uh, that's the mechanism. So be gentle with these things. Don't, don't, it, it's not a screw type. It's not a screw in type like most of the battery covers of that era. Uh, so we put it back like so. All right. And again, to, re to replace it, you simply... Give it a quarter turn in the other direction and back on. Okay. Um, top plate. Let's see. Is the top plate in focus? Oh, that's right. Um, so you've got your shutter release. You've got the uh, advanced lever and frame counter. This, it looks like a second shutter release button. It's not. This is your depth of field preview right there. Um, and you rewind. This, you also have a second meter readout right on top of the camera. Um, I've been shooting this thing, this has been my go-to camera for about a year now, uh, and that is before I started collecting the Konicas. Now, now I'm messing around with the Konicas. But before I got my Konicas, this, uh, this and the FTN were my go-to cameras for, for a good solid year. And in that time, I, I never once used this meter. I never once. I mean, it's a neat little feature, it's cute, but I've never actually used the, the, the meter readout on top of the camera. Uh, if you do a lot of work on tripods, then, uh, you know, that may be of interest to you. So, that's the top plate. Oh, yeah, you also have your um, your hot shoe right there. And what else we got? I don't think that about covers the top plate. I mean, the, your film plane indicator, in case you didn't know what that thing was, there's the film plane. Um, that's, the, that's only used, like, if you're doing, you know, microscope work or, like, really, really delicate uh, macro work. Uh, there's no shutter lockout feature, so there's no way to lock the shutter release uh, and thereby prevent an accidental um, release of the shutter. So I get in the habit of firing the shutter and then 
not advancing the film until I'm ready to take the, ne the next exposure. Um, with the Nichromats, I got in the habit or, um, uh, of advancing the film before I take the picture, not after. So that's just, that's just what I do. Um, okay, right here you've got the catch for opening up the back of the camera. Uh, most cameras of this area you pulled up on the rewind knob, not this one. On the Nichromats, you pull down on this latch right here, and it just pops the back right open. And there you go. Okay. Uh, and no, no surprises inside. Um, it has a very conventional uh, loading mechanism. I've done a separate video on how to load film for beginners, and I used a, a Nichromat FTN for demonstration. Um, and the procedure is absolutely identical for the FT2, so have a look at that video if you're, if you're just getting into film um, and you're, you're, you're still learning how to load it properly. Um, alrighty. So that is the, the once around the camera. Let's take a look at some of the specs. Um, the Nichromat FT2. Let's focus. There we go. Close enough. All right. So the FT2 um, used pre-AI Nikkor lenses, uh, uh, which, by the way, is, is one of the big... I, call, I think it's an advantage. Some people think that's a disadvantage. I think it's an advantage because nowadays, with the price of these classic lenses going up and up and up, unmodified pre-AI Nikkors are less expensive than their AI counterparts by a factor of about, you know, roughly 20%. Um, so you can save money on glass by using a pre-AI Nikon camera. And the FT2 is an excellent one to, to use. Um, the FT2 has a vertically traveling stainless steel copal square shutter, sp um, uh, shutter speeds of one second to one one thousandth plus bulb, which was standard for that era. Uh, the X-Sync was one one twenty fifth uh, because it was a vertically traveling shutter. It features a uh, split image rangefinder with a microprism donut focusing aids. This is significant because many of the old built like a tank SLRs from the late 60s only had the, um, uh, only had the microprism donut. They did not have the split image rangefinder. Um, if, you, if you've worked with manual um, focus lenses before, you will appreciate the, the convenience of the split image rangefinder. Uh, the shutter speed is visible in the viewfinder. And the light meter is two cadmium sulfide metering cells powered by one SR76 or LR44 uh, silver oxide or alkaline battery. The camera also features depth of field preview, mirror lockup, and a self timer. So those are your basic specs for the FT2. Um, let's have a look at where the FT2 belongs in the Nichromat lineup, okay? So the original Nichromat was the FT, which was introduced in 1965. It featured a full field averaging light meter. That is, the light meter did not discriminate between the edges and the center of the frame. It just gave you an average reading uh, similar to the Pentax Spotmatic or the Pentax K1000. Uh, probably the two best known cameras using a full field averaging system. Um, in addition, the FT required that you reset the ASA when changing lenses. This was a uniquely goofy feature of this particular model, not found on any other camera. And it was updated and changed with the introduction of the FTN in 1967. Uh, the FTN updated the prior design with the 60-40 um, uh, metering pattern. This is Nikon's famous metering pattern. Uh, in my opinion, it is the best non-computerized metering pattern in of the 35 millimeter era. Um, I'm a big fan of the 60-40 Nikon split. That is 60% of the meter sensitivity is located within a uh, circle which is clearly visible uh, in the center of the frame. It's marked. Uh, the balance, 40% of the sensitivity is distributed outside that circle. Uh, it, uh, the FTN features a standard pre-AI mounting procedure uh, having obviated the need to uh, reset the ASA when changing lenses. In addition, the, uh, the shutter speeds were visible in the viewfinder of the FTN uh, as opposed to the FT where they were not. Um, the FT2 was then introduced in 1975. This is the camera we're talking about today. Uh, it enjoyed all of the advantages of the FTN plus the split image rangefinder uh, focusing aid uh, and it has no mercury battery issues. It runs on 1.5 volt batteries uh, and it has the improved ASA setting procedure because of, the, um, you know, because of, of this. You know, this because of that. That's the improvement right there. Um, the FT2 was replaced in 1977 with the FT3. The FT3 was a stopgap measure because the FM wasn't quite ready yet. 
Uh, the FT3 is identical in every respect to the FT2, the sole difference being uh, it, the FT3 has the new AI meter coupling system. Uh, and that's it. I mean, the FT3 wasn't in production for very long. You don't see them on the market all that often. They're kind of rare. And frankly, in my opinion, they, they just don't have much to recommend them. Um, uh, and they, they're a little pricey because they're rare. Uh, but for a user, I, ju I just don't see the advantage. Again, just my opinion. Um, all right, so let's uh, compare the FT2 to some of its competition. Um, if we take a look at the classic built like a tank SLR, heavy metal SLRs, uh, from the late 60s, early 70s. These are the classics which all featured cadmium sulfide metering cells powered by mercury batteries. And that included the original Nicromat, the FT and FTN, the Canon FT and FTB, the Minolta SRT series, the Konica Auto Reflex series, uh, and these Pentax Spotmatic series. Although I put an asterisk here because this Pentax Spotmatic featured a bridge circuit which is less sensitive to uh, variations in voltage. And the general consensus is you do not need to convert the voltage on a Spotmatic. It will work fine with alkaline batteries. Uh, the Spotmatic was, was the, well, the, the best known of the class of um, M42 mount uh, SLRs of the 1960s, which featured stop-down metering. Um, and there are a bunch of others. I'm not going to get into all of them. This, this is kind of its own uh, subset of the built like a tank, um, but they all feature stop down metering and screw mount lenses, and that's kind of a it's a, it's a little it's a different. The rest of these are all bayonet mount uh, and offer through the lens metering at full aperture. Um, the Spotmatic was the best of the bunch in terms of uh, what it was. Uh, its competition was say the uh, the, the Practica um, uh, SLRs. Um, Olympus had an M42 mount camera. Fujica made, made an M42 mount camera, in, in addition to a number of other companies as well. Um, and I'm not going to list them all here. So most of these cameras had a microprism spot with no split image rangefinder for focusing aids. For example, that's true of um, the FT, the FTN, the FT, the FTB. I think some of the later FTBs may have had the split image rangefinder. There was an FTBN, um, and one of the, the updates with that may have been the split image rangefinder. I'm not sure. Some of the Minolta SRT series cameras had a split image rangefinder. Most did not. Uh, on the Konica Auto Reflex, the split image rangefinder was optional on the T3 and standard on the T4 um, and non existent on the Spotmatic. Um, in terms of uh, shutter speed visibility in the viewfinder, likewise, you've got that on the FTN, uh, the FTB, I'm not sure about the FT, SRT series, some yes, some no. Uh, Auto Reflex, yes. Uh, Pentax, no. Um, if you're looking for the all-metal, all-mechanical SLR with no mercury battery issues, you've got, your, your options are fairly limited. Uh, that's going to be, in addition to the FT2, you've got the Nikon FM, the FM2, and the F2. And the FT2 is less expensive than these by, by about half. Uh, the FM is the least expensive of these three and they generally go for about twice the price of a comparable or, or a comparable condition FT2. Uh, other all mechanical, all uh, metal SLRs with no mercury battery issues are the Pentax line. Uh, the Spotmatic had a bridge circuit and the KX and the MX were both made for 1.5 volt batteries. However, the Pentax uh, cameras all had a cloth shutter as opposed to the Nikon cameras, which all used metal shutters. And I think metal shutters have survived better. I think they're more reliable. Just my opinion, there are those who disagree. Um, so, bottom line, should you get yourself an FT2? So here's my answer to that question. The FT2 is about twice as expensive as a Nicromat FTN. Um, and the advantages of the FT2 over the FTN are, well, let's say threefold. Number one, uh, the mercury battery, or the lack of a mercury battery. Number two, the improved ASA setting mechanism. And number three, the split image range finder uh, focusing aid. Well, two of those three advantages <clears throat> are completely irrelevant if you're not using the light meter. These old um, CDS meters, uh, a lot of them aren't working. It's, uh, it can be, it's becoming harder and harder to find these old built like a tank cameras that have functioning and accurate light meters. Uh, the gallium light meters and silicon light meters of the uh, mid-70s to 80s have held up much better. 
so if you've got an FT2 with a good, accurate, functioning light meter, then yes, the premium is worth it. If not, then your only advantage of the FT2 vis-a-vis -vis the, the FTN, which sells for about half as much, is, um, is the split image rangefinder focusing aid, which in my opinion is just not enough to justify the cost. Um, using these cameras as meterless bodies is, is, a, is an option with increasing appeal as time goes on because these meters will fail, but nothing else will. Um, I've done a separate video on uh, the advantages of, of looking for a, um, um, uh, uh, you know, one of these built like a tank SLRs with a busted light meter because they sell for a discount. Basically, on the, most of the retail sites, if you look at a camera like this and it says, say, excellent condition, light meter inoperative, um, the price you're going to pay is going to be about the same as a lower grade camera with a functioning light meter. So like, it knocks the price down by like one, one pricing grade on most of the, on most of the retail websites. Um, so anyway, uh, look at that video. I'll talk about it there. But if you, if, so if you can find one of these with a good functioning light meter, yeah, it's worth the, it's worth the premium. If not, just get yourself an FTN. Uh, that's my opinion, my two cents worth for the day. I hope you found this information useful. Um, if so, please subscribe and check out the links below. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye.